Hello, hello, this is Pastor Hank Tyrone coming live and direct. I have an algorithm opportunity that just hit my screen. I'm deciding in real time to watch it and discuss it. It pays interest and homage to my personal spiritual past or my spiritual connection, my spiritual history to Tulsa, Oklahoma or Oklahoma in general. Okay, Oklahoma is a place that has literally only about at most 4 million people in the whole state and most of them live in two cities Tulsa, Oklahoma City that's it Tulsa was known for oil, gas boom in the 1900's it also was known for Black Wall Street in the 1900's due to segregation one of the wealthiest black sections that was firebombed and destroyed in 1921 in 2021 they celebrated 100th year fighting for reparations, which unfortunately y'all is not given to us and I doubt we ever get. But they're still fighting. My people are still fighting. I went to Bible school in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2001 to 2003. Then I went to a place called Oral Roberts University where I worked there for two years. Then I went to Norman, Oklahoma and went to University of Oklahoma where I graduated in 2010. Then I left and came to Atlanta, Georgia, where I've been in Atlanta since 2011. I'm a youth pastor, a man of God, a person passionate about the things of God. And this particular honest heart youth pastor has his you know, channel. Anybody can make a title, honest youth pastor. He has over 194,000 views. A white guy talking about a black guy. And he's going to talk about a white guy, as from a white perspective, talking about a black guy in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where black people are very minute. And this is historical Tulsa of Oral Roberts University, Kenneth Aiken Ministries, uh, B Billy, Joe, and Sharon Daughtery, Victory Church, where I went to. Um, I have a powerful, long-term, 20-plus year connection to Tulsa. But I also will state that Tulsa is just like any other city. Racism, prejudice, and the like is there. And it always will be there because of the fact that there is a issue that I believe is very now starting to be revealed for the little 14.9% of individuals that live in America. These little 14% of 40 million people, otherwise known as colored, Negro, black, niggers, whatever term Europeans may give us, are a small percentage of the small United States of America, but United States of America is powerful. It's the number one country on the planet. Out of 8 billion, there's only 500, maybe 500 million in the United States. 8 billion in the earth, 500 million in the United States. Do the dividing, figure out the fraction. You understand my point. It's a very small number. Now, what's powerful is this honest pastor is going to make a video that's 50 minutes long. We're going to watch it, and I'm going to record it. I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to come back at the end of my 50 minutes, and I'm going to diagnose it from a future PhD, future Dr. Divinity uh, level, um, and hear why this person made the thumbnail of monster slash minister. Now, in European, have always done that across the board to their own race, but this is a European doing it to an African American. Now, I don't know a lot about this guy. I'm going to research the, the guy that's over this channel. I'm going to find out where his the theology, because he comes off making some very good questions that only come from someone who went to Bible school seminary. But therefore, you got to also do your studies. Second Timothy two fifteen. Studies show yourself approved. Who taught you? Who's your spiritual heritage? Mine is, for me, Reverend Keith A. Butler, which connected to Reverend Kenneth E. Hagan Sr., which then connects to before him, E.W. Kenyon, uh, John G. Lake, a European ministers of the Protestant Reformation. And in the mixture, we African Americans have piggybacked off of it, because remember, we 14.9% in, in 2023. We're 10% in 1990. We're probably less than that in 1900. 
less than that in 1800, less than that in 1700, less than that in 1615 when we were brought here as uh, slaves to you to Virginia. Okay, so let's get on. Let me turn it off and turn my voice off. Show summer who's boss with Wayfair's Memorial Day clearance. Shop all the top grills and outdoor essentials up to 30% off with smoking. And I went from the sound man to the lead pastor of the church in four years. Now, it's a way longer story than that. If you're anywhere within the Christian space, you've likely heard of a pastor named Mike Todd. He leads Transformation Church. And when you think of Mike Todd or Transformation Church, what do you think of? Well, for me, I think of Mike Todd's dynamic speaking. I think of his problematic sermons. I think of his leadership. I think of his theology. But I also think about how Transformation Church and Mike Todd were skyrocketed into celebrity status. But how did he get there? Now, the more I saw of him, the more videos I saw about him, and the more sermons I reviewed of him, the more these questions just kept coming up. Why does he structure his sermons the way that he does? Who taught him to preach? What stream of theology is behind his interpretation? And how did Transformation Church even become Transformation Church in the first place? Well, because I'm curious and because my curiosity led me down a rabbit hole, I want to share with you what I found. So even though Michael Todd took over as lead pastor of Transformation Church in February of 2015, to get to the bottom of all of these questions, we actually have to go back nearly 50 years in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Not just to the creation of Transformation Church, not just to the founding of Transformation Church, not even to his parents, but all the way back to a university that's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, only six miles north of Transformation Church's current location. That university is Oral Roberts University. To understand Oral Roberts University, you have to understand the man that was Oral Roberts. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my happy privilege and pleasure to present the man that God has raised up with a message for your deliverance. God's man for this hour, the Reverend Oral Roberts. You see, he was born in 1918 in Oklahoma. And he began his ministry as an evangelist within Pentecostalism in the late 1940s. He became well known for his healing crusades, which drew large crowds and involved the laying on hands and praying for miraculous healings. He did this all the way up into the 1950s and through the 1950s. And he launched his own radio and television programs because of the success of his tent evangelism. This further expanded his reach and his influence. Oral Roberts believed in what he called a holistic approach to healing and education. This concept emphasized the importance of addressing the spiritual, physical, and emotional needs of the individuals in order to achieve wholeness and well-being. He also believed in the power of faith and prayer to bring about miraculous healings, and he often prayed for these miraculous healings, and apparently, according to some accounts, those happened at his tent revivals. To best understand Oral Roberts University, one must understand that it is a private Christian university founded on the beliefs and teachings of Oral Roberts himself and his Pentecostal theology. This means that the focus is on faith and healing and blessing and spiritual development. The one important thing to realize is that even though Oral Roberts did not create the prosperity gospel, he gave it a bullhorn with the platform that he had. Out of Oral Roberts University has come the likes of Joe Olstein, John Hagee, Ron Carpenter Jr., Mike Bickle, Joyce Myers, and connected to Oral Roberts University in one way or another are other teachers such as T.D. Jakes and Kenneth Copeland. In addition to these very well-known names that came out of Oral Roberts University, comes three individuals that will unknowingly play a pivotal role in the foundational theology that will be Transformation Church and its pastor, Mike Todd. For the purpose of making this overview as understandable as possible, let's start with the man that had no direct hand in forming Transformation Church, 
but indirectly put all the people in place that would have a hand in it. And his name was Carlton Pearson. Carlton Pearson has two degrees from Oral Roberts University. The first, a BA in Biblical Literature, which he received in 1973, and a Master's in Theology that he received in 1976. Now, both of these are impressive, I suppose, but one of the things that you really need to know about Carlton Pearson is that he was the personal mentee of Oral Roberts himself. What Carlton did not say when I shared with him in 1973 was that I felt in the innermost part of my being that the next great move of the Holy Spirit would be among black people. And the next great revival would be among, would be initiated by black people. And that he was going to have a leading part in it. And after graduation, Pearson becomes an evangelist and a revivalist and travels all over the country. And while traveling, Pearson meets Tommy and Brenda Todd at a prophetic conference put on by Charles Green in Shreveport, Alabama. Now, while at this conference, he hires the Todds and brings them back to Tulsa, Oklahoma to help him found a church named Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center in 1981. The Todds are freshly married and they are living in the apartment above Pearson's mom's garage. At the same time that Pearson has talked to the Todds about helping him form Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center, he also taps another Oral Roberts graduate, Gary McIntosh and his wife Debbie, to come and help found the church as well. Now, while at the church, Pearson makes the Azusa Conference, founded out of Oral Roberts University, but led by him, and appoints Gary McIntosh as the bishop of that conference, and basically lets Gary McIntosh run the conference. Now, the conference's name, Azusa, comes from the name that came from the Azusa Street Revivals of the early Pentecostal charismatic movement. Now, before we go any further, it's important to get to know Gary McIntosh a bit more because he plays a huge role, a foundational role, in the formation of Transformation Church and Mike Todd's ministry. Let's back up just a little bit. As I stated, Gary McIntosh is a graduate of Oral Roberts University. He graduates in 1975, though we have no idea what his degree is actually in. After graduating, Gary McIntosh stays at Oral Roberts University and becomes the associate chaplain for three years. After a short stint in that role, Gary and his wife Debbie both become part of the staff of a local Christian school by the name of Bethany Christian School. This is also located in Tulsa. It was after Gary and Debbie left Bethany Christian School that they've joined up with Carlton Pearson and others, such as the Tots, to form Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center. This is founded in 19. 81. Now, Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center becomes one of the fastest growing churches in its day in Tulsa, Oklahoma, averaging four to 5,000 people weekly, having a huge radio and television presence. In fact, Carlton Pearson is almost copy-paste of his mentor, Oral Roberts. This is along with all the crowds that the Azusa Conference brings. And this makes Carlton Pearson a household name in the Pentecostal movement in the 80s and 90s. In fact, many well-known Pentecostal and charismatic pastors that we know today have preached from the stage of the Azusa Conference or the Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center. One such individual, another Oral Roberts graduate, Dr. Miles Monroe, did so himself. Monroe would later become the overseers of the church that Tommy and Brenda Todd would start, but we'll talk more about that later. Though I can't say for certain, it seems that Dr. Miles Monroe had a huge impact on Tommy and Brenda Todd, but additionally, he had an impact on a young Michael Todd. So much so that Mike Todd wore a shirt with Dr. Miles Monroe's face on it while preaching through the Kingdom series. In addition to Dr. Miles Monroe preaching from the stage of the Azusa Conference, you have the likes of Joyce Myers, T.D. Jakes, Benny Hinn, Paul Morton, Paul Crouch, Jim Baker, all sharing the stage of Azusa Conference. These are the type of people that Pearson brought to his ministry. However, Carlton Pearson's ministry started to fall apart as he began to preach what was known as the gospel of inclusion. His blood covers, whether you like it or not. His blood covers your sin, whether you accept it or not. God loves you, whether you know it or accept it or not. Back in the 90s, the bishop was a successful Pentecostal minister of a megachurch in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He held popular revivals across the country, counseled presidents, and on and on. But he lost it all 
when he says he received a direct message from God that went against the teachings of the Pentecostal church. And that message was that there is no hell, that people who aren't, quote, saved are not going to hell, that in fact we have a loving and forgiving God. First, I thought there, there would, I believed in hell, I just didn't believe anybody would be in it because of the finished work of the cross. Uh, then I started thinking about the absurdity and the vulgarity of eternal torture. It just didn't, I couldn't reconcile that with the moral character of a God of love. So you come out and you say that to your congregation, 6,000 people, and it did not go over well. The gospel of inclusion being that he denied the reality of hell and started to embrace teachings of universalism. The result of this is that by 2006, he had lost Higher Dimensions Church and had been disfellowshipped from his denomination. But let's back up before that. There's a ton that happens before that. See, Gary and Debbie McIntosh leave Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center around 98, 99. And they go out and Gary becomes an itinerant preacher. He goes and preaches at events and Debbie stays at home. Now the story here of the founding of Greenwood Christian Center is incredibly interesting. And it is foundational to Transformation Church and Mike Todd's story. You see, Gary and Debbie McIntosh start Greenwood Christian Center in 1999. But before they do this, they say that the Spirit told them to do so. And I called a friend of mine who was a prophet, and so we'd meet every morning, and we'd get the Tulsa newspaper, and we would just pray, the front page of the paper. So we're just praying up a storm. The Lord said the second thing, and that was about starting the church. I had yeah. just come out of years and years of starting a church and pastoring. Yeah. I was traveling on the road and having great success and enjoying it. Yeah. She said, I think I have a word from the Lord. Yeah. And she told me and I said, where did he say? Debbie, one day while driving to Dallas, says she hears the Spirit tell her that her and Gary need to start a church in North Tulsa. Gary says that he wasn't on board at first and he's sort of dragged along, but he does say during one of his prayer drives to sort of seek out what the Spirit wanted him to do. He was driving through North Tulsa and the Spirit speaks to him, tells him to get out on the corner of Archer and Greenwood. And on that corner, while Gary is praying, he claims the Spirit told him, reverse the curse. Later, Gary researches what happened at that corner. And it was the race riots of 1921 that had started right there. Now, this video is not about the race riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, but I would recommend that you look it up and be informed about it. Because the foundation of Transformation Church, which had been previously called Greenwood Christian Church, is built on the idea that Gary and Debbie are to go to North Tulsa, plant a church, and quote, reverse the curse. Gary and Debbie do just that. They start Greenwood Christian Center in a house in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1999. They eventually would end up at the exact same location that Transformation Church would be in until 2019 when they bought the Spirit Bank Center. But again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Now, while Gary and Debbie are planting Greenwood Christian Church, Tommy and Brenda Todd are still at Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center. In fact, they stay there and form a parachurch organization called Gap Standards. Gap Standards is basically an organization in which they will come to your church and teach you how to pray prophetically. Brenda leads a ton of this. And for the small price of $200 plus, they can teach you that same thing too. And that parachurch organization is started while they're at Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center. They actually stay there until 2003. And it's unclear why they leave. It could very well have to do with the direction that Carlton Pearson was going with his theology. The reason I doubt that is because in a Twitter post from 2018, Mike Todd includes Bishop Carlton Pearson as a pastor he looks up to and appreciates during Pastor Appreciation Month. Despite the fact that Carlton Pearson had been declared a heretic by his denomination long before that. What I think probably happened is that the Todds wanted to get out on their own and they wanted to make sure they could grow gap standards. So they go out in 2003 and do just that. From 2003 until 2008, they pursue this idea of growing Gap Standards International. They're preaching itinerantly every Sunday at a different church, preaching about prayer and building the body. But in 2008, they form a church also in Tulsa called Spirit and Truth Praise and Worship Center. Mike Todd has said he thought this was the dumbest thing they could ever do. 
they, in 2008, they started a church. And I told them, this is the dumbest thing you could ever do. Like, <laughs> y'all are 50 something years old starting a church, like, and you can't even start on Sunday mornings. You're gonna have to do on Sunday night because they're full-time itinerant ministers. And so they were usually preaching somewhere on Sunday mornings and then would fly back so they could preach to their church on Sunday night. I was like, this is dumb, don't do it. They were in their 50s. They were traveling for gap standards. Why would they want to plant a church? In fact, Mike Todd was so against this, he doesn't even attend the church for the first eight months. But that doesn't mean he wasn't attending a church. He'd actually already been helping out at Greenwood Christian Center, led by Gary and Debbie McIntosh. Mike Todd ran the soundboard for them. Now, two things happen during this time that drastically affect Mike Todd personally. Mike eventually decides that he would go help his mom and dad at their church because they were in desperate need of musicians and he knew that. Now, after being there for a month helping them, he says his mother came up to him with a prophetic word that he was supposed to lead the youth. So I started going to Sunday nights to help them with the music. Maybe four weeks after I started helping them with the music, my mom comes to me in this deep prophetic kind of tone and she's like, God told me. You're supposed to do something with the youth. I said, you have four other sons. <laughs> like, and, and you only have seven people in your church. Why would you, why would I be doing anything with the youth? She said, God said, you're supposed to do something with the youth. He said at first, he just sort of brushed it off, didn't care. But after a month, he agreed that he would do it. But he does acknowledge that he never studied to teach. And when he went in there, basically, he just told the kids stories that he remembered from his heart. And I had never studied. I had never preached a message. I would never been in front of anybody. We just, I would go in there and I would be myself. I would use Bible stories that I learned it from like McGee and me. And like, <laughs> I am not, I am straight. Like, expectations. Yeah, bro, like the Odyssey. Like oh, I was like, I, <laughs> like, I was just using things that, that stuff raised us, man. That, yeah, I was using things that were stuck in my heart. Yeah. While at the same time, claiming that the first night he went to youth group, before he went in to teach them, God told him four things. He said four things. He said, I want you to be real. I want you to tell on yourself. I want you to love them first and don't judge them. Wow. So in 2008, Mike Todd is running the soundboard for Gary and Debbie McIntosh at Greenwood Christian Center and leading a youth group that starts with only seven people, half of which he's related to. They named the group SoFly and it stood for Sold Out Free Life Youth. We started on that first day and it was called So Fly. And they named it Sold Out Free Life Youth. So Fly, our mascot was a fly. That's good. It was great. <laughs> According to Mike Todd, for six and a half months, he just kept doing the same thing, saying that he was just telling the kids that there was a better life than the sinning that they were doing. And during this six and a half months, he says the youth group grew to 150 people. Now, Mike says that even at that point, he still wasn't studying to teach. He was just telling stories and altogether not taking it very seriously. He was going to the youth group every night, doing what he had always done before. And this goes on for over a year until the group grows to 250 students coming to SoFly. Now, at the same time, Mike's parents still have less than a dozen adults attending their service. And at that same time, Mike is asked by Gary McIntosh to become the music director at Greenwood Christian Center because their music director had left and he needed to fill the position. So in 2008, Mike Todd is leading an enormous group called SoFly with 250 students and is asked to take the music director job at Greenwood Christian Center, a job that would come with responsibilities that Mike Todd didn't like, but he submitted to simply because he had the job. And that was staff meetings. And I've never been in a staff meeting in my life. I've never worked for anybody, a real job. So this is just kind of like, okay, I'm in a staff meeting. I'm sitting in the very back, like ducked off in the cut, waiting for this to be over every meeting. Now over the next two, two and a half years, Mike just keeps doing the exact same thing. Leading SoFly Youth Group, growing it and sustaining it, while at the same time on staff at Greenwood Christian Center, being the music director and attending the staff meeting. 
Now, somewhere around this time, it is important to note that Mike Todd gets married to Natalie Todd on June 19th, 2010. This doesn't necessarily affect the theological underpinnings of Transformation Church, but it is a shift in Mike Todd's life that will affect things that come later, such as relationship goals. But we'll get to that in a moment. Now, at this time, Mike Todd says that he felt the Spirit tell him to bring the idea of merging the two churches together. Something that he did discuss, but says that neither party was interested in. And so one day I felt like I should just say it. And I said, man, y'all came here 30 years ago to help Carlton Pearson build higher dimensions. Do, do you think y'all could come together to do this together? And they were like, nah, that, that'll never work. And I was like, okay. Three months later, the Spirit said, say it again. And I said it again, and they both were like, well, maybe. And they started talking to their oversight. Larry Stocksteel um, was Gary McIntosh's oversight, and the late Miles Monroe was my parents' oversight. And June 4th, 2011, the churches merged. And Spirit and Truth Praise and Worship Center merged with Greenwood Christian Center, forming what is now known as Transformation Church in June 2011. Now, this merger left Gary and Debbie McIntosh as the lead pastors, Tommy and Brenda Todd as the assistant pastors, and Mike Todd as the youth leader, now of a combined two youth groups. The youth groups, Todd says, had 500 students at their first meeting of the joint churches. This many students seems to shock Mike into the realization that he needs to actually study and prepare for what he's speaking about. And that's when I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> this may be for real. And so I started studying. He starts an internship program and a 12-person leadership team built off of that, while at the same time teaching high school and college students the importance of tithing so that he can fund the program and pay staff. Gary McIntosh sees that the church seems to have two completely different cultures. One, a student-driven one that Mike has from SoFly, an adult one that meets on Sunday mornings. And he wants to bring those two things together. But in order to do so, Gary has to give Mike more authority. And Mike becomes the executive pastor of Transformation Church, a role in which Mike oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the church, the ministry, and Gary preaches the main services. That is, until Gary has a heart attack and is out for eight months. For eight months, Mike Todd is thrown headfirst into leading a church, preaching the sermons, leading the small groups, and doing the daily duties that a pastor does until Gary is able to return. I think this is a good place to note that Mike Todd has no official degree in biblical studies, but Mike does account this time as being his quote unquote seminary in which he learned how to do the things that a pastor does. And so people ask me, did you go to seminary? Or I said, yep. For eight months, I preached four different messages every week to four different crowds of people. Wow. So on Sunday morning, I preached to this older, traditional group of people. On Sunday night, these unsaved, horny youth. And then on, <laughs> on Wednesday night, I preached to the people who wanted to go deep in God. And then on Saturday, we had an internship, and I had to teach at that for eight months wow. every week. Wow. There you go. And it about killed me. Yeah. It's not Eventually, in early 2014, Gary McIntosh comes back and asks Mike to preach some of the services until he's able to fully recover. It was during this time that Mike Todd says that it was clear that there was no vision coming from the leadership of the church. In fact, he had talked to Natalie and he was fully okay with quitting the church and moving on. However, this doesn't seem to be the full reason why Mike Todd was wanting to leave the church. Mike describes this as one of the, quote, darkest moments in leading in ministry. He was about to give up and quit. There seems to have been some issues in the church, whether that be church leadership, growth, immaturity, and Mike Todd, he never says. It was at this time that Tim Ross, which was currently a youth pastor at the Potter's House in Dallas, Texas, and had previously spoken at one of Mike Todd's youth events, calls Mike and says that he has been having dreams about him and he wanted to see if he was okay. 17 hour time difference. 17 hour time difference. And this was how he said, he's like, hey, what's up, Mike? Uh, this is Tim. Because this is our first phone conversation. Yeah. Period. Post conference. Yeah. Yeah. Period. We've never yeah, talked. Yeah. We've before. never talked on the phone. On the phone. No, no, no. no he no. said, uh, right. he said, yeah, you've been in my dreams. God won't let me sleep. And I just need to know what's going on. And that was the exact day I told my wife, I'm done with ministry. Mike Todd says that no one would even know who he was today if it was not for the intervention of Tim Ross calling him that day. He equates his friendship with Tim Ross as saving his ministry. 
Nobody would know Mike Todd. Nobody would know any. If Tim Ross would not have called me from Australia on that day at that time, I might have committed ministry suicide. And their relationship has only grown in depth and strength since. And it continues to do so as Tim Ross is now the oversight pastor of Transformation Church. At some point in the course of events in May 2014, Mike Todd goes to speak to Debbie and Gary McIntosh about leaving the church. Mike and Natalie Todd have a meeting with Gary and Debbie, basically discussing that he doesn't feel like there's any vision left in the church anymore. And Debbie and Gary agree. But they agree because they say that they're not the ones that are supposed to have the vision anymore. That it's actually supposed to be Mike and Natalie. Mike is resistant to this idea at first, saying that he never wanted to be a pastor and quote, I don't like people that much. However, Gary lays out how Mike has been doing the work of the pastor since he was gone. He lays out over and over again about how Mike specifically built a team, how he specifically raised funds, how he was doing the things that a pastor would do anyway. Gary, as some sort of reassurance, tells Mike that he will set up a long-term succession plan and that Mike will not take over the church until 2019. Mike likes this idea because it'll give him a chance to train and get ready. Things do not go as planned, however. And in September of 2014, during a random sermon, Gary announces to the church, unknown to Mike and Natalie beforehand, that at this time next year, in 2015, Mike would be the lead pastor of Transformation Church. Now, Gary and Mike apparently do not set up a definitive date that this transition is going to occur, but Mike does say that the Holy Spirit spoke to Gary on January 3rd, three days into their 21 days of fasting and praying, a word that would change everything. Three days into our 21 days of prayer and fasting in January 2015, the Holy Spirit told him, he said, if he's not the pastor February 1st, it's not going to be good. And he called me right out of prayer. And he said, we about to do this thing now. And I said, do what then? He said, you're about to be the pastor of Transformation Church. February 1st, 2015. And all I can say is there was a supernatural grace that came over me and Natalie's life when, when we were handed that baton. And um, it was so crazy. Mike sees this as a fulfillment of what God had told Gary back in 1999 about reversing the curse. Mike recounts that the first Sunday before preaching, the Lord told him four things to set the vision for the congregation. And God told me, he said, you're not supposed to do it like this. He said, I want you to build a multi-church. And I said, okay, God. And he always tells me four things. Like, I don't know what this four thing is, but it's, it's right before I got up there, he said, I want you to say this the first day you become the pastor. He said, you're going to be a multi-ethnic church, a multi-generational church, a multi-campus church, and a multiplying church. And I want you to tell them on the first day, that's what you're going to be. The reality is though, the church was in a very rough spot in 2014 when Mike and Natalie went to speak to Gary and Debbie about leaving. Mike recounts that the entire first year he was pastor, he turned over almost all of his staff, either through people leaving the church, people having to be fired, or people moving on to other ministries. It was me and a business person. That's all Transformation Church was. One year into it. And God said, close your eyes and get the vision. Wow. Wow. And so that season was super hard. He says it's at this point that the Holy Spirit told him to close his eyes and quote, get the vision. Mike says that during this time, he wanted to make it not about who was on the platform, but set a culture of worship. So instead of having professional musicians play the service, they would make YouTube playlists and use that for their worship on Sunday mornings. Around this same time, while Mike was seeking the vision that he says the Spirit had told him to do, he claims that the Spirit gave him a word for the year. Now this is a practice that Mike Todd has continued to do to this day. The word that Mike Todd received in 2016 that he was supposed to apply to 2017 was the word beyond. We always gather around a word for the year and God said, we're going to go beyond. Like this is our year to go beyond. At this point in 2016, Transformation Church had 500 people coming a week with a budget of $1.2 million operationally. Now during 2017, following the idea of beyond, Mike claims that the church grew to 900 people and grew to a budget of over $1.6 million. Now what may have attributed to some of this growth was the influx of people and money from a church plant called Eden Tulsa that joined together with Transformation Church. Eden Tulsa, 
was being planted by Charles and Abby Metcalf. The Metcalfs were planning a new church in Tulsa and starting their small community group meetings March 5th of 2017. They were planning to launch the church later that fall. Charles and Mike formed a relationship and in August of 2017, Mike says the Spirit told him to take Charles on a trip with him to Dallas. I think I was on my way back from sabbatical and I was like, B, I don't know what I'm gonna preach when I come back. And you just like, led by the Holy Spirit, yeah. I know it was now, but you flippantly said like, you should do a series on relationships. Yeah. And I was kind of like, eh. And from that, honestly, I didn't have anything else. Like in my mind, there was no other thing. And she planted that seed. Yeah. And the crazy thing that most people don't know is that she planted the seed about us doing a series on relationship goals. And then Charles was not a part of our church. Um, really? He was, no, he was planting, <laughs> he was planting a church yeah. and the Holy Spirit told me to take him on a trip with yeah. me. And we went on a trip together and on that trip in Dallas, yeah. we went to a coffee shop and I was like, man, I got to start this series on Sunday <laughs> called yeah. Relationship Goals. Yeah. And me and Charles wrote our first sermon together. No. Do you remember this? Yeah, the first sermon we wrote together yeah. was before the person. Yeah. Really? Sitting at a cross. I got a picture of it. I'm like, I'm, we need to put up the picture yeah. of it. And we wrote this sermon together. He was not a part of the church. It was on this trip, the Sunday before he was going to preach the relationship series, that they wrote the sermon that would eventually go viral. It was also during this time that they apparently planned on merging the churches together. So on September 24th, 2017, Charles announced to Eden Tulsa that they were joining Transformation Church. On October 10th, 2017, they posted about that merger with a video release talking about the merger on October 26th. Hey guys, Charles and Abby here. I uh, hope this video finds you doing well. We just want to take a second and share with you guys. Uh, you may or may not have heard, but God has been doing something so, so special in the life of Eden. And we are actually merging with Transformation Church here in Tulsa. And we are so, so excited about this. It's super, super special uh, because we truly realize that as the body of Christ, that we are truly better together. This weekend, we're actually celebrating that at Transformation Church at 9 o'clock at 11.15. You can join us there. We can't wait to see you, and we hope you come out and celebrate with us. Yeah, we love you guys, and we'll see you there. The day after this, Mike Todd releases a video about joining them for their first service together on October 29th. 2017 to be a part of a historic Sunday this Sunday as Eden Tulsa and Transformation Church become better together. That's right. We are merging and we did not even see how God was going to take us beyond this year, but he's blowing our minds and we want you to be a part of it. So you have two opportunities to celebrate with us. If you want to be in this place because it's going to be crazy. I have a word from God that's going to help your everyday life. And I promise you the praise is going up in this place on Sunday. I can't wait to see you there. I'm coming home. Now it's not too long after the merger that Charles preaches his first sermon at the church on November 19th, 2017. Now coming off a great year, Mike is anticipating that the word for 2018 is going to be something dramatic. It was beyond in 2017, what would the word be for 2018? However, he claims the spirit gave him the word stride. And Mike was displeased with this word. And he said stride. S-T-R-I-D-E. Wow. I'm like, I don't even, I've never used that word, like stride, like what is that? I had to literally look it up. And so for three months, I just acted like God missed it. Like this wasn't the word he said, like. In fact, he says he didn't tell anybody on his team what the word was going to be, even though they kept asking. Mike claims that on Tuesday, December 5th of 2017, during a yearly church strategy meeting, which covers growth and finances and planning, his friend and oversight pastor, Tim Ross, stood up and spoke about how this type of growth wasn't sustainable. It was during these comments that Ross says that the church needed to learn to quote, stride. And this leads Mike and Tim to speak all night about how the church could stride and slow down in 2018. It was apparently this word from his friend, Tim Ross, that convinced him that the word he had heard from the Spirit was the right word. Well, they plan all night long and they come to the conclusion that while Jesus only had three years to fulfill his ministry, he never ran to his next appointment, but rather he had a stride about him and they needed to do the same thing. 
the term they continued to use was the pace of grace. And while this is something that Mike and Tim spoke about while strategically planning in 2018, it seems to be something that Mike was taught way back in his childhood by his mother. But the thing that you said earlier was how you would do what to set a mood right, right. back in the day. To this very day, it's nothing new under the sun. Right, okay. There are still, there is still music that is being uh, used mm -hmm. to set the mood the and the atmosphere of the day. The yeah. same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, with our son, Michael, who writes, produces, arranges, and preaches, all of that, preaches, he does it all. But see, when Michael was a little boy, um, we would often, I would often uh, take him in a certain room in the house and, and, and he plays drums just like mm -hmm. you used to play drum and then several other instruments and all of that. And I would teach him about atmospheres and how he could shift and change the atmosphere with drums. And to this day, I don't care who he plays with, he leads because he understands atmospheres and how to shift and change them, but where it's coming from, a pure vessel yeah, that yeah. understand. I said, Michael, let me tell you something, baby. I said, with those drums, you can beat hell completely out of the room. <laughs> Stuff can be going on and you can make a difference. Demons and devils would have to flee just because you understand how to shift an atmosphere. And to this day, he understands how to shift a generation because of uh, you know, understanding the word of God and how to set moods and how to bring a difference in the hearts and lives of young people. Excellent. Now coming out of this meeting, Mike tells his staff on Wednesday, December 6th, that they are going to be canceling the 2017 Christmas production. Mike claims that they were trusting in the Lord to provide, even though they were canceling the program. However, he was still worried he wasn't making the right decision, that he was going to let people down. Until a tweet went out on December 22nd, 2017, of an individual he didn't know that didn't attend his church that shared a 10-minute clip of a relationship goal sermon he had preached a few months prior. Now, to be honest with you, I have searched and searched and searched for this tweet, and I cannot find it. However, he claims that this clip was seen by 2 million people in 48 hours hours. In addition, he claims that it exploded their YouTube channel and this sermon as of now has 10 million views. Now Mike doesn't speak of what they ended up doing for the 2017 Christmas service and we don't know either because that video isn't available on their YouTube channel. All we know is that the Sunday after Christmas, Mike preaches a sermon entitled You Can't Stop Me. Then, their first service starting off 2018 is a five-part series entitled Stride the very word Mike said the Spirit had spoken to him. Mike Todd and Transformation Church enter into 2018 riding high on the success of 2017. Because of the success of relationship goals, Mike Todd's influence begins to skyrocket, and along with his popularity, so does Transformation Church. Mike Todd begins to become a guest speaker at a number of the largest churches in America during 2018, and he actually speaks at the very university that we mentioned at the beginning of this video, Oral Roberts University. So they only gave me a little time to preach, so I'm about to go in hardcore, okay? So I want you to get out your Bibles right now, and I want you to turn to Psalms chapter 1, verse 3. Um, at Transformation Church, about a month ago, we've been stuck in a series called Planted Not Buried. And um, oh, y'all have heard it, okay? For everybody who doesn't and hasn't, um, I really feel that God told me to come here today to encourage somebody's faith. Um, because there's a lot of people in this room who are in situations and circumstances that it feels like you're buried. And I came to tell you that you're planted. And, and, and I came to let you know that there are certain things in your life that you have to walk through or you will not be ready for what God has for you. This success takes Transformation Church from one service each Sunday to five services each Sunday between 2018 and 2019. And in August 2019, Transformation Church, to accommodate the growth, buys the Spirit Bank in Tulsa, Oklahoma for $10.5 million. No, for real, don't play like that. I got the keys, keys, keys. I got the keys, keys, keys. I got the keys, keys, keys. Now, this is where I think it's important to zero in on one of the reasons people are so ride or die with Mike Todd, especially those that attend his church. 
See, when we talk about the Spirit Bank Event Center, there's something that we have to go all the way back to March 9th, 2015 to talk about. Mike claims that 37 days after becoming the pastor of Transformation Church, he was told by the Spirit to write down that, quote, the Spirit Bank Event Center will be Transformation Church. Um, we went from one service to five services in one year. And I was, they were about, they were trying to kill me. <laughs> and, um, and, and I was like, God, we got to do something. And 37 days after I became the lead pastor of Transformation Church, in my time of being quiet with the Lord, I was in my daughter Bella's room. She was just maybe a few months old. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, he said, write this down. I pulled my laptop up and now I'm used to hearing this voice because I practice it from seventh grade. Mm -hmm. A lot of people is like, I, I don't know if I hear God, it, it's familiarity. You'll start learning as you make the Very time good. for it. Very good. And, um, and, and so, so write this down. I pulled my laptop out. And the first thing I wrote down is the Spirit Bank Event Center will be Transformation Church. 37 days after being a pastor, we had no money in the bank, had 300 people literally voting every Sunday if they were going to come back the next Sunday. It was crazy. But God told me, he said, I want you to believe me. And I began to write this down with about 11 other things. And it was M March uh, 9th. 2015 7 29 a.m bella's room i had the presence of mind to mark the moment and 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 i think that did something to the story because a lot of times we're like god told me something god told me something mm. but it becomes a testimony when you mark the moment very good and when i marked that moment five years later i was at a place where my faith was like god you got to do something that's going to prove that you're good, you're big, and you are not to be messed with. I don't wanna stay at the starting line for, for 20 years talking about, I wanna see your power. I wanna, I, either this is real or it's not. Either, either you're gonna be a big God or I'm about to do something else. And God was like, you testing me. <laughs> and, and, and what ended up happening is when I was at the moment of my stress, God said, I already gave you the vision for what you need to do about the church. And I was like, I don't remember. I forgot that I wrote that down because it had taken so long. But I was learning in that time, the principle that is in the earth of seed, yep. time, and then harvest. And I forgot about it. I literally one night in prayer, um, God said, go back and check two hard drives ago. I go back and start checking vision. I just type in the word vision to my hard drives. This paper pops up from five years earlier. And God said, there it is. I said, this is it. I go to my team and my staff. I said, y'all, we're believing God for the Spirit Bank Event Center. We're going to do this. And this is when crazy faith came to me because I, I, I'm, I'm an extremist. Like, uh, I, I, I can't be like, we're just going to believe God in faith because that seemed weak at that moment because I knew this wasn't going to happen. If, if we just came with it at a mediocre kind of like, maybe if it happens, if it doesn't. And it just came out of me. I was like, we're going to believe God in crazy faith. And my team was like, Pastor. And something birthed on the inside of me that day. And I went to the people and I said, find us out if this building is available. And these people came back and said, it's unavailable. I said, God, I thought you said this was it. He said, you thought a closed door meant no? And so we started staying in faith with that thing. And I said, we're going to get this building. And they was like, it's not available. Next week, hey, is anything happened? It's not available. Hey, building, it's not available. And to the point where I started getting discouraged. See, nobody talks about, they just want to shout on top of the building and say, I got the keys, the keys. But there was a time when I was about to quit, to quit, to quit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. And when I was about to quit, we started looking at other buildings. And my team one day came and they was like, well, we found this Kmart building that's, that just shut down and all this other stuff. And I was like, all right, I'll go look at it. Be careful what you entertain when God's already given you a promise. We walk in that Kmart and there's poles all throughout the entire facility. And I knew what God showed me was something where we could do state-of-the-art video and all this other stuff. And I said, this ain't it. No poles. 
I said, we're not settling for poles. So they started looking for other places. And this is what happened, Richie. We went to some other building that was nicer with no poles. And the realtor said, how's it going? And something rose up in me. I said, do you really want to know how I feel? And that man looked at me and said, sure. <laughs> I said, this is what God promised me. I said, I don't want to see another building until this is available. I said, God told me this is the building God promised me. And I was so, <laughs> I was so filled with faith and conviction that that man called those people every week until they were about to sell the building at the closing table. I love God with another company. 10 minutes into the closing, the funding falls through. Oh, because Bill called every week while in the closing room with somebody else, he picked up the phone, called our real estate person and said the funding just fell through. The building somehow is available. Are y'all still interested in it? What we thought was a setback was a setup. We didn't have the money when I first knew we were supposed to get it, but we were stacking them coins in preparation for the promise. We got that call on a Tuesday. We put down the earnest money on a Wednesday. The company was a big entertainment company and had deep pockets, came back with the funding on Friday, but they couldn't get it because God's child already had it. Now, I tell you this story because it's one of many stories of why so many people are so ride or die with Mike Todd. When he tells them that God told him something and then that thing miraculously happens, it just solidifies the idea that Mike Todd is anointed by God and he is God's man. So when people like myself or others point out his poor exegesis or his improper theology, they truly do not care because as far as they're concerned, God is behind Mike Todd and Transformation Church. Now the first service that was held in the arena was on February 10th, 2020, in which Mike Todd preached a sermon called History in the Making. However, shortly after moving into the building in 2019 and right alongside of Mike Todd's Relationship Goals book being released in April 2020, the coronavirus hits the states. Now, what is seen by many as a setback, Transformation Church sees as an opportunity. Using the time to exclusively go online, perfecting their video presentations, remodeling the arena that they had just bought, and expanding their online reach. They take advantage of the reality that millions of people are glued to their phones and their computer screens. And aside from the release of his Relationship Goals book, he also releases another book based on a sermon series at this time called Crazy Faith. Now, what cannot be overlooked is during this time, Transformation Church gives out millions of dollars to different organizations in the community. In fact, they give back more money and affect more change in Tulsa, Oklahoma than any church that had come before them. And after COVID was over and they had remodeled their arena that they had just bought, Transformation Church reopened with Homecoming Sunday. To be honest, it doesn't seem like there's really any stopping Transformation Church. With Mike Todd at the helm, they are skyrocketing in popularity as well as favor within the community and the world that they minister to. In fact, it only seems like Transformation Church and Mike Todd will continue to grow in popularity. Nothing stands in their way. Everything that Carlton Pearson dreamed Higher Dimensions Evangelical Center would be is coming to fruition in Transformation Church. Though he had no direct hand in Transformation Church, it is undeniable that his influence lives on through Mike Todd today. In fact, there are some parallels that I think are worth seeing here and exploring. The fact that both men are dynamic leaders, able to gather large teams around them, both claiming to hear from God, setting forth a vision, and then propelling that vision forward. Using their platform to promote relatively unknown upcoming pastors and speakers. And due to their popularity and charisma, both garnering success on both radio and television. Mike Todd, for example, was recently signed to TBN, the exact same network that helped Carlton Pearson spread his message back in the 80s and 90s. As we've discussed in this video, we already know how Carlton Pearson's ministry ended, in heresy. We, however, do not know how Mike Todd's will end. 
It cannot be denied that Mike Todd is a dynamic, engaging speaker. The real question is this, will Mike use the gift that God has given him to declare the gospel to the ends of the earth, declaring that we can be reconciled to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he lived the perfect life that we could not live, that he died the death we should have died, that he rose from the dead in defeat of sin and death, that he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father and will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. Or will he? I'm taking the time right now to go through with this gentleman uh, who is pretty much the typical European theological seminary colleague of, of, of us, those that want the PhD, the Doctor of Divinity, and the learned scholars have argued. First and foremost, I want to say, now that I had the time to actually let it be played from start to finish, I want to say that this is just another copycat of 1974. 1974 was when black men were able to come into the white ministry. The world of Oral Roberts, Kenneth E. Hagan, people of the 1950s, they were white. Blacks were still, in 1950, dealing with separate and unequal. It was 1954 in America when the 10% of blacks that lived in America, mostly in the South, was by the Constitution getting access in public entities. It took 25 years for that to come. It took a whole generation of people to die and the kids of that generation, to, and that's me, to get those opportunities. I was born in 1974, 20 years after 54. And I went to completely integrated elementary, middle, junior, and senior high schools. And colleges, military, everything of mine has been, has been integrated. And then I ended up going to Bible school in Oklahoma and Tulsa in the 2000s, from 2001 to 2011, a whole decade. And I could truly say I came at that time where Colin Pearson was falling. He had already preached the gospel of inclusion. He had lost his church by 2006. When I got to Oklahoma, everybody and mama was going to higher dimensions. But Higher Dimensions was dying because Gary McIntosh, the guy that was spoken in this, was the roommate of Colin Pearson. They went to Oral Roberts University. Nobody knows about Oral Roberts University unless you have been brought up in the evangelical world. And if you have been brought up in the evangelical world, you are aware. But that's a tiny part. I'm here to say there's a lot of negatives and a lot of truths in this video, but I'm also here to say that this is a small, small city, man. 1% of the United States of America. Very few people are born again. That's why we got to preach the word of God. And debating on whether you like this pastor in Tulsa, let's be clear. Tulsa, Oklahoma still has a history of the murder, massacre, and killing of black people in North Greenwood, the same area that he is playing at church. So the benefit of this church is off of the horrible pains of the ancestors, the great-grandparents of him that died because of a lie and anger and racism in the 1920s, which of course came from the 1900s, which came from the 1800s came from the Civil War of the 1860s. The point I'm making is, it's, it's very easy to pick and choose, and that's why I say you must go to 2 Timothy 2.15, and you must study God's Word to show yourself approved, and really analyze the sermons. I'm angry, because as I hear this man preach, it reminds me so much of my former young pastors. When I was a young Bible school kid, ignorant of the word of God. I'm now much more mature, much more knowledgeable, much more intelligent. And unfortunately, millions of people that get into the word of God, 
you know, never get there. They stay stuck to Mark 11, 23, 24. Never read verse 25 all the way down to the end of the chapter. Never memorize the full context of those books. Never even get beyond those books into the Old Testament Torah to fully understand and appreciate the New Testament. Because the 99% of the word of God today is called seeker friendly. And this comes from the book called Purpose Driven Life way back in the 2000s by a white man in California. And his book that millions of churches applied and copycat to this day. As I now add my four cents and as I now speak, I'm going to now tell you my story because this is not just me rehashing somebody's video. It really is about me interconnecting my life to this because I'm very much a part of it. Didn't know it at the time, but God allowed me to go to Oklahoma. God allowed me to, to be able to ride past the, die, the, the dead higher dimensions, which was a mega church. There was a period of time in Oklahoma where huh, they were the place where everybody went. Bishop T.D. Jakes, all the ministers, they didn't go to Dallas. There was no Dallas today. There was no Potter's House Dallas. There was He was in West Virginia. All the ministers came on, uh, to Azusa. 19, they started in 1988. The peak of Azusa was 93, 4, and 5. The death of Azusa was 99 all the way to 2006 when Pastor Carlton Pearson started preaching the gospel of inclusion. And Tulsa has kind of been struck because it was that black man, Carl Pearson, that drew blacks to Or Roberts, that drew him to Rama, that drew him to Tulsa, period. I didn't know that at the time. I had no cognitive clue. When I was a Bible school student coming out of a place called Jacksonville, Florida, my pastor was a Bible school graduate of a man of God that had went to Rama in the 70s. And Rama at that time was a small little 100, maybe at the max, uh, Bible school of 100 students. Like anybody can start a Bible school today. And Kenneth E. Hagan had been a minister that had been preaching at that time for 45 years, the message of faith, a white man from East Texas. And there are a tiny few amount of blacks that was going to this Bible school. Many of the blacks left the Church of God in Christ, the Baptist Church, the AME Church. Those are the three major denominations of the black people in America. And they went to Oklahoma. Well, they went back to their hometowns. They started their churches. And they did exactly what Pastor Todd did. What I see with Pastor Todd is a copycat of what was done in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And 2000s with Bishop Keith A. Butler. You go to any mega city of, of Atlanta, Georgia, Detroit, Michigan, and Atlanta still is okay because of movies, but the day will come where Atlanta will die and people will migrate somewhere else. But at the time of 1980s and 1990s, Atlanta was not the place. Atlanta was kind of like a sleepy town uh, uh, of... Uh, some blacks, but it just was never considered on par with Dallas, on par with Detroit, on par with Brooklyn or, or New York, on par of or Chicago, right? Cleveland. All of those cities have died and it's forced the blacks to now come south. But guess what? In 100 years, should be just Terry, it'll fluctuate again. We won't be here, but it'll fluctuate again. So the lesson I guess we can learn from this guy's analysis is that at the very point that I want to say it was great for him to explain in a little bit Oral Roberts. He didn't talk about Kenneth Hagin at all. I noticed that. That wasn't even in there. But definitely Oral Roberts. He didn't talk about Richard, but he did, he did talk about Oral Roberts. 
and he talked a little bit about uh, 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 most of it about Carl Pearson. When Carl Pearson got disqualified and disowned by Oral Roberts, it broke his heart because Carl Pearson was supposed to be the black man that was going to take over the Church of God in Christ, merging the black Church of God in Christ with the white sea faith evangelical or Roberts University. When I went to Oklahoma for Bible school in 2001, I, of course, went to Rhema, of course, graduated two years. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, hope I started hanging around Oral Roberts University. Never been around a, a Bible school or a Bible university. This university was founded in 19, I think, 65. And so I'm born in 74. And my mom never, you know, did not go to college. She couldn't afford it. None of my aunts and uncles could go to college on my mama's side. On my dad's side, they went to HBCUs, but they, were, they did not go to any biblical HBCU. So it was like, well, you know, you know, you, you go into Bible school um, and then you, you see you go to Rama, and now you see Oral Roberts and you're like, man, I would love to go to Oral Roberts. Now, Oral Roberts was a my God. It had to be because it's a private school. Uh, their tuition was forty five thousand a year. Most of the time, the people that went there were upper class, upper, upper class whites. So if you're an upper-class white, you go to Oral Roberts. The reality is that for most of the people that went to Oral Roberts, like anything, you, you, you're kind of like stuck in a, a tiny bubble. University of Oklahoma, even though it's a lower-tier you know, school, it's on par with the University of Alabama. It's on par with the other state-run schools. Or Roberts is not really on par with anything. Um, it's it's a school that has been taken care of and founded by those that are some you know love Or Roberts, but they had a belief system which I agree with to this day. They believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. They believe in seed faith, which I now regret that, but I do believe we should help our ministers, but we should never give to get meaning I don't give money to my pastor uh when I am about to be evicted for a home don't have the ability for my to have my own apartment and I'm gonna go sow a seed to church because I'm believing God to take care of me and help me not get evicted no no it's that you're not gonna get that prayer answer you gotta first de determine what made you mess up to get to that point of about to be evicted and then you may, and because of the sin that you made, you may have to be evicted and you may have to work on your own financial skills so that you can learn from it, i.e. bankruptcy. But in the church world, we had so many poor blacks, so many poor blacks and so many rich whites. So when you go to these ministries like Oral Roberts, you're around all these rich whites and you are a poor black, of course you want to get what they want. And that's why a lot of blacks have fallen into that um, seed faith mindset. Prime example, um, Money Coming to the Body of Christ, a book written by Leroy Thompson. 1997, when I got saved, it was the hottest book out in the world for the black church. And what it boiled down to was be willing to give money at the moment. If the pastor's preaching a powerful word, walk up to him and drop the money at his feet as if he's God. And God's going to bless you. Never happened. Never happened. It was wrong. It was heretical. But, uh, but it made a lot of people want that. We, and there will be a, 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 a group saying that we would all say, Money! To me now. Well, how does money come? Job, skills, education, degrees, certifications, work ethic. That's it. It's don't come to you by just confessing it. So these are the areas that we got messed up on. So that's the same thing Mike Todd is doing. The tragedy is this. It's literally, literally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Let me make myself clear. White people that, especially this white guy who is probably from Tulsa, because he said so much uh, about Gary McIntosh 
he had to be growing, growing up there. You can't live outside of Tulsa and know all the inside secrets that he was talking about in this blog. You had to come there and spend a decade there and be watching and listening and studying uh, like I had, like I did. And even still, there's a lot of stuff that I don't know about Tulsa. But if you are a person like um, this guy, you can tell he was connecting 1974, 1984, 94, 2004, 2014. And now we're going into 2024 next year. And he was connecting all those dots. We had the COVID movement, which destroyed a lot of big church businesses, rightfully so. Now, for the next 10 years to the next COVID happens, I wonder what the church is going to be doing to now. I hope they don't try to rebuild buildings and they, and they, and they build YouTube channels. But we'll see what happens. May God richly bless you, my brother.